Hi everyone! Sorry to start late and sorry for the lack of chairs. This is the only room left in college. Um, so today we've got Balan Jalal coming to do a talk for us about dreams and disembodiment. So uh, Balan works at Trinity College Cambridge um, as a neuroscientist and used to work at Harvard as a fellow. Um, so he'll be talking about sort of the realms of consciousness, sort of sleep paralysis and the hallucinations, lucid dreams that come with that. So covering quite a range of areas. Um, he's worked quite closely with Ramachandran, who wrote The Telltale Brain, if you've read it. Well, I personally haven't thought it was very good. So um, uh, without further ado, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ella. <laughs> All right, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, and today we'll be talking about the human brain. So I study the human brain. And as, as you all know, the human brain is terribly, I mean, it's complex, right? I mean, you have these neurons, there's about 100 billion, uh, billion neurons in the human brain. And each of these neurons connect with other neurons, making up to one quadrillion connections in the human brain. That makes the human brain easily the most complex form of matter in the known universe, right? So that's, what, that's the uh, topic that we're tackling, right? It's a very, very complex thing. So sleep paralysis might be one of the most interesting uh, phenomena in the entirety of, uh, of, of medicine, if not science. I mean, here you have this condition where you're lying in your, be in your bed. Suddenly you might realize, my God, am I awake? I feel like I'm awake, but I'm, enti I'm entirely paralyzed. I cannot move. I cannot speak, right? And you might have this feeling of an intruder in your bedroom approaching your body you know, choking you, strangling you, okay, even potentially sexually violating you, okay, that's, that occurs pretty commonly. So this is a pretty, pretty, like, from a neuroscience perspective, I mean, here you're lying in your bed and have all these things occur to you. What's going on in the brain, right? Now, but before we go there, one could ask, why do we, like, why do we even sleep? Like, what's the purpose of sleeping? When you think about it, you think about it, you go, well, look, the purpose of me living is to procreate, like have my genetic material being passed down to the next generation, right? And so why would I sort of put myself at risk, you know, spending all these hours uh, vulnerable, sort of in a risk, risky situation, um, you know, predators can attack me, what's going on? I mean, this alone shows you that it must be very important for some, there must be something going on that's very important. Well, we know that sleep is important for detoxica detoxification of the human brain, so beta amyloid is protein that can, you know, create, create things like, like dementia and Alzheimer's, and it's good for your immune system, your cardiovascular system, and there's a, a numerous benefits of sleep. Now, one benefit that I'll mention that I find pretty intriguing is the idea that like the neurotransmitter serotonin is very important for for a sense of uh, basically cognition really like sense of memory alertness um, a feeling of like basically like being awake, it's important for a lot of, lot of things. A lot of things in terms of wakefulness and alertness and, and, and position and concentration, a lot of stuff like that. It's one of the, it's probably, it's probably the main neurotransmitter of our entire like, brain. And so the idea here is that when we sleep, neurons that produce serotonin stop firing altogether. They stop working, okay? So what happens is there's a replenishment of serotonin. Okay, there's replenishment, right? And then when we wake up, ideally, we should feel refreshed. Ideally, I don't know about everyone, but you should feel refreshed because now you have all this serotonin being available, made available to you, right? And then you have serotonin throughout the day, right? And as you go by your day, uh, basically serotonin become less, becomes less and less available and you start feeling tired and you're feeling sluggish because you need serotonin to feel like, on, like alert and all that and memory becomes slowed down and then by the time you're like, I don't know, like 2 a.m. you're very tired, right? And you want to go straight to bed so you can have your boost of serotonin. Boost, boost, boost of serotonin meaning that you will have now charge your, 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 your uh, serotonin, right? It's like charging the iPhone, you plug it in to, throughout the night and then serotonin and neurons will stop firing, replenish, and then so forth. Okay, good. Now, so let's keep that in mind as we proceed. When we go through sl sleep, you go through different stages of sleep. One of these stages is called REM sleep. REM sleep is really, really interesting. 
During REM sleep, you're paralyzed. Like all of you guys were paralyzed for the, a portion of the night last night. Completely paralyzed from head to toe. Okay? And, and, and more than that, more than that, during REM sleep, you have very vivid and crisp dreams. Very vivid and crisp dreams. They have a sense of a narrative. Okay? So you have that during um, REM sleep. REM, okay? Good. So you're paralyzed. Does it make sense that you... When you have these vivid dreams, let's say you're wrestling with an alligator, okay? Would it make sense that you'd be paralyzed during that time? What do you say? Like if you act out those dreams, could that be a good idea or a bad idea? Pretty bad idea, right? You might hurt yourself, you might hurt your sleeping partner, right? So your brain is very clever, it says, okay, let's paralyze this, paralyze this dude, okay? So you're paralyzed from head to toe. Very good. Now, if you look at the brain of somebody in REM sleep, if you eavesdrop on the activity of neurons, right in a guy who's in REM sleep and you look at the neuron and the neural activity and then you look at a guy who's wakeful and you look at the neural activity of this guy over here who's wakeful and you compare guess what so. they look very similar okay in fact in fact if you look close enough the guy in REM sleep looks more awake than the guy who's actually awake okay so there's a lot of activity going on all right so this guy looks very much awake he has these vivid dreams and they're usually very bizarre are dreams bizarre? Like, could you have a dream where you sort of, I don't know, like, you suddenly find yourself on the moon, open a fridge, you want to have a snack, but then you're at Liverpool, playing for Liverpool suddenly, or having tea with the queen, everything is just bizarre. Could that happen in a dream? Okay, why? Why are dreams so strange and bizarre? Well, it turns out there's a structure in the human brain, the DLPVC, okay, just a fancy name, just jargon for a structure that's important for your sense of logic, okay? So the feeling like I have all these things I put together um, to create my sense of reality for myself, okay? So I, I'll say, okay, Balland, neuroscientist, here at Oxford, I'm giving a lecture, handsome, okay? I have all these concepts, okay? I put them, to get, put them together in a meaningful way, and I create my reality. And I need logic for that, and logic is here. Is logic working during REM sleep? No, okay? Logic is diminished. It's working, but it's very diminished. Okay, sense of logic. logic. What about the sense of agency? Do you have agency when you dream? Meaning, do you, okay, do you know you're dreaming when you're dreaming? Sometimes. Some people do? No? You don't know you're dreaming when you dream? So some people do. As a, they claim, right? They claim. They, right, right. Most people, though, do they know they're dreaming when they're dreaming? No, right? Okay, here's a question. I'm being totally serious, not being frivolous at all. Okay? Could this be a dream right now? Like, might you in a five, like five minutes your alarm on your iPhone is going to go off and you're going to head to university? Seriously. And we said dreams are bizarre. Have you ever seen a guy with like a hat like this, weird accent, straight out? <laughs> like, could this be a dream right now? <laughs> well, could life itself be a dream? Oh, that's going too far maybe. Philosophy. Where's the philosopher? Where is he? Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. Right? So the idea is that I don't have the answer to that, whether this could be a dream or not, okay? Um, but the point is, dreams are very strange and they're very bizarre. The same, the same structure in the brain, the DLP, the PVC, okay? Dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is important. It's very, very important for basically like uh, being able to like um, being aware. Like, you lose the ability to f know that you're aware. Metacognition, meta-awareness goes away. Okay, so we established that. That's good. All right. So there you go, the alarm goes off, you get to university, right? <laughs> okay, um, so we covered that. What about a sense of... So we said dreams feel very real, we covered that. What about memory? Do you... So we said memory, you don't remember your dreams when you wake up, do you? Yes. Sometimes. Sometimes you do, but, but, but not very much, right? There's a sort of fragmented nature to dreams. But why, though? That's, that's a good point. What else? Seroto serotonin. Serotonin, right? Is, is serotonin, did we say it's important for memories? Mm -hmm. So serotonin is important for the f basically transmitting short-term mem short memory to long-term memories, okay? So that transition, so you need serotonin for that. Serotonin is now deactivated, okay? The, the neurons are not working. They're off. They're on holiday, okay? 
Right. So for that reason, you can't remember your dreams very well. In fact, when you, at the moment when you wake up, there's a surge of neuro, uh, serotonin. Serotonin, in a, in a sense, is, is, is a part of the process of wakefulness and waking you up. So at that time, right when you wake up, that's when you want to like, write down your dreams because you have this, this, this couple of minutes where you can sort of benefit from that. But other, other than that, memory is pretty, pretty diminished. Again, serotonin, important, is not working as it should yeah. during REM. Right. Okay, what about this? Have you ever had a dream where you're sort of being chased by like a Frankenstein, like monsters chasing you? You want to get away, right? But you can't. Even though the, the creature is bloody slow, right? It's, it's barely moving, but you try to get away, but you can't get away. Have you ever had that before? Who had it? Everyone? Okay. So what's going on there? Any ideas? Okay, getting close, getting close. Okay, so motor programs in my brain, they are firing when I move, right? I move my arm, my legs, whatever. Motor programs, prefrontally and so on, they start firing. These, these neurons will start, you know, be activated. Okay, that's good. What about when I merely close my eyes and imagine myself doing some movement? Is there activity of my motor neurons? Yeah. What if I dream and sleep? Is there activity of the motor neurons? Yes, there is activity. Okay, however, you are paralyzed because movement is done up here, prefrontally, the premotor neurons, right? Paralysis of the entire body is done by the brain stem. Okay, the brain stem has structure, the, the medulla and the pons, which are responsible for the sense of paralysis. Okay, so you have motor programs firing away, but you can't move, right? So we, we established that. But what about in your dream? Because in your dream, you can just make it up, couldn't you? Right? You can just say, well, I am moving because it's my dream. I'm not awake, right? So what's going on there? Well, the idea is that in your dreams, dream there, you're trying to get away from the Frankenstein monster. You're trying to get away, but, but you have serotonin, which is important for frontal centers. It's sort of on, on, on like working half-half, right? It's not working as it should, and it's, it's pretty much very, very diminished at this point, right? But you have all this fear activity, and the fear activity of the brain, the instinctual part of the brain, the brain stem, the emotional part of the brain, the limbic structures, they are very active now, okay? And usually when we are awake, the, the emotional and instinct, instinctual part of the brain are usually inhibited by the frontal part. So my frontal part of my brain is, is working, serotonin is working fine when I'm doing wakefulness. However, during sleep, the, the serotonin, right, is not able to make the uh, frontal center strong enough and the motor programs can simply not compete with all the emotions of fear coming from the brain stem. You know, they have, they have, they can work all freely now. They don't have all the prefrontal stuff, you know, inhibiting all the activity. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Okay, so, so far so good. What about time perception? Another, another important one. What about time perception in dreams? Well, maybe, but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. This is, my, this is, a, this is an experiment, actually. Ramachandran and I proposed this, okay? We want to do this experiment. Now imagine, if you have this chap, he's sleeping, okay? As he's sleeping, now, He's in his REM dream, whatever it is, right? He's walking around Oxford, it's very sunny, you know, whatever, he's walking, you know. And then suddenly, during this, blue, this beautiful sunshine, what you do, in his, that's, that's his dream, right? This is Joe sleeping. Balan comes to Joe and sprinkles water on Joe's head, okay? And then wake him up right away. You see, I do it instantaneously. Water, wake him up, okay? Will he be able to incorporate that water into his narrative. Like, would he be able to go, oh, and then suddenly I was walking here in Oxford, and suddenly uh, these clouds came out, and, and it started raining, and took, took up my umbrella, you know? Is time perception slowed down during REM? Or is it like, I was, uh, was dreaming, and suddenly somebody like, poured water in my head? Like, which one is it? And this is experiments we don't, we don't have the answer to. And it's potentially very important. Like, if you have, like, thousands of years down there, it's like, have you seen Inception? Like, thousands of years down there is, like, uh, a few hours up here. You might go crazy down there, you know? Don't go. Something like that, right? So, so, those are, so those are all intriguing questions. What about this? Have you ever had a very meaningful conversation in your dream with some, like, person in your dream? Like, a very meaningful, deep, you feel like, my God, I really connect with this person on so many levels, <laughs> right? <laughs> Or you might have a romantic fling in your dream, right? It happens. Have you ever thought about that other guy is actually yourself? 
And there's nobody else in you. And think about it. Is there anybody else in your dream? That's yourself, right? You're having a fling with. Just think about that, okay? All the chick is dudes, whatever, it's yourself. Now, what, what about, that? I'll tell you something that happened to me. I was actually, and this is like a few months ago, probably, I think a few months. And I was having this dream, I was having this conversation with this guy. Okay, cool, he seemed pretty cool, okay? And he told me a joke, and I started laughing, okay? I started laughing, I couldn't stop. To the point I woke myself up from laughing. I go, ah, ha, ha, I woke myself up. My God, what happens, right? I, I just woke myself up from laughter. And then I thought about it, I went, look, this other guy is actually myself, right? And if I know a joke, I shouldn't find it funny because jokes are only funny when we don't know the joke, right? And that's the whole point. You have to have a uh, sort of a story plot and then you have a punchline. That's the whole idea. So somehow my brain temporarily suppressed the information of the joke to make it funny to me. I mean, that's pretty cool. How the, it shows you how complex the brain is and how it works in layers. Um, and then I had another dream where I saw this woman. I wouldn't even go there, man. It was just next level. Like, I wanted to propose to her, but then I realized, God, it's myself and stuff. I, I won't go there. <laughs> okay. All uh, right. Okay, so we covered that. Now, I've done sleep paralysis in around f five countries now. And I, my main colleague is Har um, Devin Hinton at Harvard, Harvard Medical School, and we've explored this phenomenon. It's truly intriguing. So all around the world, people have different interpretations of it. Even though they kind of see the same thing, it's like a shadow-like creature, but then their sense of culture, like, basically, uh, like, gives the experience a certain uniqueness, right? So... Guess in Egypt, I've done studies there. Guess in Egypt, what, what do people tend to interpret sleep paralysis as? Have you seen Aladdin, the evil genies? So in Egypt, it's like an evil genie that attacks you, it chokes you, it strangles you, it kills you. Okay? What about in Italy? I've done studies in Italy. In some parts of Italy, it's like the panda fica. It's like a, uh, uh, like a, a witch, a witch-like creature. Okay? All right, can you guess what it is in the U.S. sometimes, among some populations in the U.S.? <laughs> Who said Trump? <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. Space alien abduction, okay? <laughs> so they lie in their bed and they have this feeling of a, of a you know, this, this spacecraft coming down and this, this uh, gray coming down from the ship and experimenting on the, on the helpless sleeper. So that is one interpretation in some parts of the U.S. Not all of them, but some parts. My colleague out there has done studies on this. So very interesting. Uh, suffice it to say that yes, so you can have these experiences and, and what I've come up with is this panic hallucination model. It's sort of the theory of, theory of everything just for sleep paralysis. And the idea is that if you have a certain cultural narrative of what's, about what sleep paralysis is. Say you see sleep paralysis as, I don't know, like this is these ghosts attacking you, they have a certain name, call them the boogeyman, they come at night, they do certain specific things. So it's all part of your culture and you have a um, cultural tradition around these creatures, right? If that is the case, it seems like our data suggests that then you're more, more likely to have more fearful episodes, longer episodes, okay, so they last longer, they, perceive, they are perceived to last much longer, and you tend to have very vivid hallucinations in some cases, and you have higher rates of it. So it occurs much more frequently, right? So you have it once, and then it occurs again and again. Okay, so the question is why? What's going on there? So I, I'll, let me illustrate this with the little Lisa example, okay? So I'm going to pretend to be little Lisa, okay? Now, little Lisa... She lives in a far, far away land, this fictitious island, very far away. Now her grandmother, okay, tells little Lisa, sleep paralysis, in fact she won't even use the word sleep paralysis, she says the boogeyman attack is something that you don't want to experience, okay? It's the boogeyman coming and choking you and sexually molesting you and doing all these things to you. Be careful now when you go to bed. Okay, so she, little Lisa, my God, she is primed now. She is terrified out of, out of her mind, okay? Great. She goes to bed. She goes to bed, all right? When she goes to bed, what occurs is that she's predisposed for a couple of reasons. Reason, uh, reason number one being that when you have fear, when you are anxious, the anxiety part of the brain, limbic centers, amygdala, is basically overactive. It's called nocturnal arousal. When you have nocturnal arousal, and then you have, that could wake you up during the REM stages. It's likely to push you to be awake, okay? Factor one, anxiety, nocturnal arousal. Predispos predisposing factor two. When 
she now, when she now thinks about the paralysis sensations when she sleeps, in fact, she might start to unconsciously monitor the paralysis sensations. In other words, she's more alert to any kind of feeling in her body that's different. Oh, I'm sleeping. Did I feel something? Is the boogeyman here? You know, like, did I feel a pressure here? You know, she's just more alert. She's, she's, that's what you call cultural priming, okay? Predisposing factor one, anxiety. Predisposing factor two, we said, uh, let's call that hyper alertness to paralysis sensations. Right, so we have these two, right? When she now feels something, because she's so anxious and so aware, and she feels something, she goes, my God, let me get out of here, the boogeyman is here, right? And what's the first thing she does? She tries to move, because she's fearful. Never mind that the fear will already make her even more fearful, so the fearful creates this positive feedback loop, so it becomes more fear. So fear keeps um, basically feeding on itself. Right, when she moves, we said, we said that when you move, right, she sends commands, the neurons fire, saying move, move but there's no feedback coming back from her body because she's paralyzed. Move where? You're paralyzed, right? Okay, so she can't move. So this discrepancy between uh, basically neurons firing away, telling her to move, and the lack of feedback coming back from her body will, is more likely to create these out-of-body type experiences. We, mentioned, we talked about that, right? So she has all that. Now she sees something, a shadow in the corner of the room, and that, that shadow, you know, is, is, is oh, it might be the boogeyman because your you know, imagination takes over, a sense of like creating this narrative around that. Does that make sense? Is that clear? So you see how she can color this experience through her cultural filter. Now she wakes up the next day, she go, my, goes, my God, I was attacked by the boogeyman. She has even more anxiety, okay? She's even more fearful. Guess what? The next day, she's even more likely to have what? Sleep paralysis, right? And it occurs two or three days later. And the sixth day, uh, you know, and then keep occurring now, she develops maybe chronic anxiety, right? You see how it can spiral? So this shows you how potentially one experience that occurred, and because it was interpreted in a certain way, she might have potentially developed psychopathology. Now, the psychopathology link is not totally established in science. So we have some preliminary findings. So one idea, so what we found, that basically in Egypt, when you hallucinate during sleep paralysis, you're more likely to have elevated um, anxiety and PTSD symptoms. So an indicator, indicator. Second link, okay, we found, me and my colleagues found in Italy, this is a very, this is recent stuff, that if you have fear during sleep paralysis, you're more likely to have PTSD and anxiety symptoms again. But I think the most intriguing and convincing link was done by my colleague Richard McNally at Harvard, and the study was the following. People who interpret their sleep paralysis as space alien abduction, Okay, these guys, when they listen, when they listen to the encounters with these space aliens on, on basically an audio uh, tape, right? So they listen to these encounters as they are narrated. The physiological reaction they display is comparable to somebody with PTSD listening to his traumatic experiences. You see what I'm saying? So it seems like his, this person who saw an alien Right, his PTSD-like symptoms from this event is comparable to somebody who actually went to war or something. You see what I'm saying? And that's why I started out saying maybe this is the most intriguing phenomenon in the entirety of medicine. Because here you're lying in your bed, sleeping, my God, and you have a potentially a traumatic experience. Now I can tell you most cases of sleep paralysis totally benign. Nothing fearful in most cases. It's these unique cases that are interesting, and especially if your culture um, is, is sort of you know, directing the script for you and, and having certain ideas, you know, providing certain ideas to you about what it is. <coughs> now, so this would be a mind-body interaction example, and it would be an extreme example of the nocebo. Have you all, about, all heard, heard about the nocebo effect? Anyone about nocebo not clear? The nocebo is this uh, opposite of the placebo. The placebo effect, you all know that, right? It works pretty well. You give somebody some water, say it's like, I don't know, super juice, and he feels all s strong, right? That's well known. Uh, did you know that, in fact, the placebo effect, effect if you tell some chap that the, it's a placebo, he still, it still works. Did you know that? It's pretty fascinating. The nocebo, okay, it's the, fa it's the opposite. So you give somebody a... a a pill that's sugar and tell him you're going to die from this, you know, he's my God, you know, he's got to physiologically react to, you know, creating a, a mind-body interaction, right? So this sleep paralysis could potentially be a, a strong example of the nocebo effect in some cases. Not, all, not in all cases, not in most cases, but in, perhaps in some cases. 
uh, MR therapy, right? So this is a therapy that I designed, that I designed for sleep paralysis. And the idea is, is very simple. It's this, this idea that, look, I have all these instinctual part of my brain firing automatically during sleep paralysis. I'm pretty helpless, right? My cognitive, like basically my prefrontal, all that stuff, you know, is pretty, pretty weak at the, during sleep paralysis. Now, however, can you train yourself to start to regulate your emotions using frontal structures? Because you do have some sort of access to that part of your brain, right? Because you're sort of half awake, half sleeping, right? So this, this is the idea that perhaps you can, and you can try to decondition your ex the experience by, by trying to manually change what's going on. And attention, you all know attention is very scarce. I mean, you have limited attention. Can you uh, start to focus all your attention on something extremely positive and affect in that way your emotional state? You know, the orbital, orbital frontal cortex is a very important part of the brain, okay? It's very important because it sort of seems like this part of the brain can affect your visual centers. So there's an interaction between the emotional part of the brain, okay, the orbital frontal cortex, okay, and the visual. So visual, emotion, orbital. So if you can control your emotional state using your frontal cortex or frontal cortex, controls your emotional centers, you go from negative to more positive, can it then affect your visual state and the hallucinations, you see? So these are some of the ideas. And plasticity, you know how the brain, brain how plastic it is, how easily it can change, like if you do certain things, okay? You can change your brain very, very easily. So this is the idea that if you do this continuously, having positive affect, positive emotion during sleep paralysis, avoid moving during sleep paralysis, then perhaps you can control the experience and, and turn it into something more positive. Now, let me end on this note. I want to end on this note. Uh, Oh, so I had one sleep paralysis happen to me once. I mean, it happened to me a few times, but one particular time was interesting. I was in California again, and I found myself, bizarrely, that I was sort of lucid. I was lucid in the sense that I could kind of leave my body. That can occur during sleep paralysis. So I felt like I could lose my body. I'm obviously, I'm not sure if, well, if you had a video camera, I probably for sure it wouldn't look like that, right? I felt like I could leave my body, so I, walk, I stepped out of my body, and I started walking around in my apartment. I said, my God, I'm down there sleeping, okay? But now I have this ghostly body. So as I walked down around the apartment, I said, look, this is a perfect chance for me to do an experiment, okay? <laughs> Seriously, I swear, this is what my first thought, okay? So what I did was the following. I saw this piece of paper, okay? This piece of paper on the floor like this, and I went, down, I took it, and I put it in my pajamas, PJs, okay? Put them down there, and I thought to myself, if I go back to my body, okay, and I wake myself up, and the paper is still there when I wake up, I would have made a breakthrough of some sort. I mean, it would be pretty interesting to try it. You know, let me try this. So I did that. I went back to my physical body, and then I, I woke up. Now, here's the question. I'm being totally serious. Was it there when I woke up? Yes or no? How many, say, how many people say yes? Who, say, who says no? Well, it turns out, unfortunately, it wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> but I can still joke with my colleagues saying that we are a uni unique group of people who can say we're working while sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. We have that privilege, right? So, <laughs> so something good came out of it. So that's all I had. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.